here we are, the final chapter of 1 Corinthians. Uh, well done. If you've been with us the last two years, we've got through this book uh, together. Uh, chapter 16 seems like a very personal message to the Corinthian church, doesn't it? I wonder if you're like me, it might feel appropriate to skip this chapter completely, or at least fast forward through it, get quickly through it, and move on to our next topic, maybe 1 Samuel, uh, starting next week. But actually, no, we're here this morning and we're devoting an entire sermon to this chapter. Why? Well, wonderfully, this chapter is still God's word to us today. But in this chapter, we see glimpses of how God's church should be doing the, the Lord's work in the Lord's way. Paul sums it all up for us in verse 14 of chapter 16. He says, do everything in love. When I was in year nine, I bought a book called How to Be a Professional Basketball Player. Inside it, it laid out all the work that I needed to do uh, to break into the professional world of basketball. I was convinced that my love for basketball, in fact, my obsession, my addiction even, to basketball was going to guide me and, and how I approached the next few years of my life and would transform me to be the person that I really wanted to be, a professional basketball player. Now, it's 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Here I am standing in front of you at 37. Clearly, it didn't work out for me, did it? But it was a true reality for us. What we love, the things we love, shape our motivations, and it shapes what we do in our lives. Last week in chapter 15, Paul's already shown us the one who is most worthy of our love, the one who has transformed us already to be new people. What motivates God's people in life is what God has already done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the closing verses of chapter 15 that we heard read, Paul tells us this, the sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Isn't that wonderful words? We are victorious over death and sin through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can stand firm in this life, not moving from our identity as God's people. His love for us has brought us to him and now we want what God wants. The world to know of his love, to know him as their God. And it's the work that God's people are called to do. And so today, here in chapter 16, nestled within these very personal instructions and encouragements and comments of Paul to the Corinthian church, we see the characteristics, the very markings of how God's church does the Lord's work in the Lord's way, doing everything in love. The Lord's work's marked with cheerful charity, with aid and opposition, with humility and hospitality, and with example, unity and love. For us today here at Forestville, there's an example and an encouragement for us to imitate and to follow as we seek to do the Lord's work in the Lord's way here in our community. Uh, you would have received a sermon outline uh, when you came in. Please use that to follow through with the flow of the talk, make some notes. And let's keep our Bibles open in chapter 16 as we go through this together. Let me pray and ask God to help us through his word and his spirit this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word today, Open our hearts to love you more dearly, to be captured by the importance of your work and move us by your spirit to joyfully live our lives and serve you as your church. Amen. Well, we see firstly that uh, the Lord's work is marked with cheerful charity. And we see Paul's words at the start of chapter 16 in verse 1. Paul says this, Now about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian church to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men that you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. We find Paul giving instructions to the Corinthian church on how best to gather a collection for the Lord's people. What's interesting is this word collection, it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. And so it's not a giving of money to the local church that we would expect uh, the Corinthian church to be doing, but it seems that it's, a, it's rather a collection of money 
to be given as a charitable gift. We, we glean from Paul's instructions that this donation of money is going to Jerusalem. And most certainly it's probably going to help the suffering Christians who are there in Judea. They might be poor, uh, suffering from the famine that we see in Acts 11, but certainly they're exposed and persecuted in all kinds of trials and imprisonment for their faith. We see that this is a collection, a gift of love that's helping physical needs. And how is it that Paul guides the Corinthians in preparing to be charitable and to give this gift? Well, he encourages them to be practical, to set aside a sum in advance that's in line with their income. The, Greek word, the kind of Greek phrasing of, the, of that wording is really it's saying, in the way that God has prospered you, set aside what you're choosing to give. These words suggest that Paul's encouraging us that whether God has prospered their, uh, the Corinthian church a little or a lot, anyone and everyone can contribute to this gift of charity. I think in today's world, we're very captured with this culture of individualism. It's really like, look after yourself. But it's really important for us to remember that God's never intended for our life to be lived like that. It's not every person for themselves. God's actually created us as humans to care for each other's needs. He wants us to be involved and compassionate with the needs around us. There are physical and spiritual needs, certainly even within our church, that God's church should not shy away from helping. I'm really encouraged that in our church, we see God's people looking to serve the needs of our people. Just one example is, I love how quickly, when, when a family is in need, how quickly a meal roster is brought together and people sign up to make a meal for that family. I think the generosity and the sharing of care in that moment, such a wonderful reflection of God's compassion and love for his people. And I'm encouraged to think, uh, to see how we as a church think not only locally about needs, but uh, beyond that too. I'm always encouraged to see our church family setting aside money to partner with, with charities like Tear Fund to care for poverty-stricken communities around the globe, uh, funds that are helping communities grow their own food, have access to education and health resources. At Element last year, I was encouraged to see our teenagers putting aside money to take part in Operation Christmas Child, to give the gift of toys, school supplies, hygiene items to kids who would never have that were it not for those gifts. When we as God's people give to help the needs of others, we're not only showing love to the person receiving that gift, but we're actually revealing God's love to the world as well. This is not a small thing that, does, that goes unnoticed in our world. In fact, in the life of the second century, there was an Athenian statesman who wrote this about Christians and about the church. He said these words. He said, they walk in humility and kindness. They deal honestly and they love one another. They take care of widows and orphans. He that has much gives to he who has little. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and treat him like family. When one of the poor passes away from the world and he can't afford a proper burial, they provide for the burial. If they hear that any of their number is in prison or oppressed for the name of Christ, all of them provide for his needs and seek to get him released if possible. And if there is among them a man that is poor and needy, they will fast two or three days so that they may supply that need. It's a powerful picture of charitable community, isn't it? A people of God motivated by his love to sacrificially care for the needs of others. Here in Forestville, where are the needs for us to be involved in the ministry of God's love, to be cheerfully giving for the needs of others in our immediate lives? And perhaps even more valuable than our money, where can we be generous towards others with our time, our compassion, our energy, our friendships? It's true that actually in our church, with us, people find the only listening ear in their life. They find their only real friendships in this world, their only source of compassion and patience and love. And it's in this way that actually all of us in this room serve as ministers of God's church as we care for each other with God's heart for his people. But it also takes us as God's people being willing 
to express our needs as well. The pride of self-reliance, again, this, individual, this culture of individualism that ha captures us, it locks us away. And we're either not willing to share the needs that we have, or perhaps not willing to accept the help when it's offered to us. And when we do that, we actually rob each other of opportunities to care for each other the way that God loves us. We actually hinder the Lord's work in our midst. We stop the love of God's people from serving and caring for us. I know I'm that kind of person. I'm quick to say no. And I wonder, are you that person that struggles to express your needs or to accept that help? I want, you, I want to encourage you to be courageous. Allow God's people to show care and love to you as we do the Lord's work. Well, secondly, the Lord's work is marked with aid, but also opposition. And we see Paul talk about this uh, in verse 5 of chapter 16. Paul says, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. Well, Paul's intentions are to visit the Corinthian church, not just to pass through them and see them just for a time, but to stay with them and also to be aided by them. Now, it was a custom in the ancient days that uh, if someone came to visit you for a time, that you would accompany them for a short distance, maybe to the next small town, uh, see them safely on their journey. Uh, perhaps Paul means that, but I think Paul actually has the intention to welcome members of the Cor Corinth church to join him in his travels to be part of the mission to reach the, uh, to reach the world with the gospel. Already this has happened in the Corinthian church. Members of their church, Aquila and Priscilla, have done just that. They've gone with Paul uh, and joined in his mission in Ephesus to spread the gospel to people who do not know him yet. And I think Paul's hope is that his stay with the Corinthian church, if the Lord permits, will allow him to take others with him to be involved in this Lord's work. And I know over these last few years as a church, we have felt the challenge to be involved in God's mission in our community. God's love is held out to our world in the gospel. It's, it's, a, it's a message that needs to be told. It's a gift that needs to be given away, not just in the world beyond, but here in our own backyard. Just last week, I was reading and I was astounded to hear this. 38% of people just here in Forestville identify themselves as agnostic, or atheist. There are people who need to just hear about God and also about his love for them, isn't there? And it's God's love that keeps us reaching out to those who need to hear about Jesus and sending, seeing this great door of opportunity that he's here in Forestville and reaching out our hands to aid in the work of the gospel. There is right now for us an open door of opportunity in our local primary and high schools we have the opportunity each week to take the gospel and share it with the young generation in SRE. And I wonder, are you someone who could set aside an hour of your week to help our teachers take the gospel to schools? Perhaps you could set some time over a few weeks to be trained up to be a teacher, to take the gospel and the good news of Jesus into our local schools. I know that I would love to and Sarah would love to chat with you about that there is such a door of opportunity for us to be sharing and aiding the gospel here in Forestville. It's one of these great doors of opportunity that actually has kept Paul in Ephesus where he is, doing the Lord's work. We see this in verse 8. Paul says, I will stay on in Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. So what's wonderful about this picture is that Paul has not snuck in through a window he hasn't slid under a gate to preach the gospel in Ephesus, but he has walked right into the spiritual entrance of this city and he has brought the gospel of Jesus. There is actually no obstacle blocking the path to effective work for the Lord, but there is opposition, isn't there? There are many adversaries, many who are resisting the gospel, many who want to silence the good news of Jesus. And yet, despite opposition, we can read about this in Acts 18, we see that the gospel spreads not only through Ephesus, but the whole of Asia, so that all the Jews and the Greeks who live there 
hear the word of the Lord. And I wonder if you notice this in Paul's tone. I don't think Paul sees opposition as this terrible, evil thing. In fact, he sees it as proof that the kingdom of Christ is advancing and that the work of the Lord is effective. Do we have this same mindset when we're faced with opposition in doing the Lord's work? Do we find our courage and our commitment wavering when opposition comes against us? I'm going to confess, sometimes I want to just quit the day and go home when the technology at church isn't working. I'm like, ah, this is too much. But what happens when we're faced with real opposition? Yeah, sometimes that's accusations. It's abuse. It's slander. It's judgment from our society. But I think it often comes to us most heavily and sharply in the expectations of our family or our friends. Perhaps the demands of our bosses and our co-workers. Perhaps for you, my young friends here, the opinion of your schoolmates or your uni friends. I feel that expectation with my family and friends. There's a demand from them to be not so occupied with the Lord's work. There's a command from them to not take God as seriously as I am. There's a warning from them to not give all that I have to the Lord's work because God doesn't really, isn't really owed that much from me. Often those kind of oppositions, they weigh on us the heaviest, don't they? They're closest to home. And yet Paul would encourage us to not be discouraged, but to actually take heart. You see, when we're most opposed, that's often when the Holy Spirit is wrestling with the hearts of the lost. When sinners are wrestling with the God who's calling them to him. And often when we're the most opposed, that's actually when God will give us the ability to speak most clearly about his love, to defend our faith truthfully, to confess Christ as Lord in the most courageous and uh, clearest ways. If you're in this room today and you're not feeling opposed in your faith, I want to encourage you, how are you using that opportunity to have gospel conversations? Are you inviting family and friends to come and meet Jesus? Are there friends that you can bring to Christianity Explored in a couple of weeks that they could meet Jesus for themselves? But I know that many of us here feel opposed. We feel tore down inside. We feel held back from serving God the way that we want to. We might even feel our love for the Lord dampened and our desire to share Jesus really silenced. Let's confess that to each other after church. Let's share that and let's bring that to the Lord together in prayer. The God of love, he's with us. He will aid us to do his work. He will give us courage to face opposition together as we do his work his way. Well, thirdly, the Lord's work, it's marked with humility and hospitality. Uh, Paul introduces us to Timothy in uh, verse 10, and he says this, When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear when he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Uh, Timothy going to Corinth is not news for us. Uh, If you have a good memory, we read about this last year in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 16. Paul has said this about Timothy. He says, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. See, while Paul continues the work in Ephesus in this great door of opportunity, it's Timothy who's coming back to the, to the Corinthians to encourage them. And we can sense that Paul's very anxious, isn't he, to know that Timothy will be received well by the church in Corinth. We know from Paul's letters to Timothy that Timothy's a young man, perhaps young in the faith too. He's perhaps timid in nature. In a church in Corinth where some members have even gone as far as to question the authority of Paul, we can imagine what a tough and difficult situation Timothy is walking into. But Paul reminds the Corinthians here of the purpose of Timothy's work. He is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. Timothy is coming with the authority and the responsibility that Paul had to teach, to encourage. It's 
very likely that the Corinthians had actually asked for the big guns to come back. Paul, why don't you come back and teach us and be with us? Hey, why don't you send a Paulus? He'd be great. And certainly we can understand one of those two with Timothy would be great, wouldn't it? But we see in verse 12, Paul says this about Apollos. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to go with you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. I wonder why Apollos didn't choose to go. We know from 1 Corinthians 1 that there were many factions uh, that had merged in the, in the Corinthian church. Some had declared, we're only going to follow what Paul says. Others said, we're only going to follow what Apollos has taught us. Others, we're going to follow Peter. Maybe Apollos feared that his presence there would encourage his faction to keep up their inappropriate devotion to him and his teaching. I think in reality, though, Paul and Apollos are committed to the work of the Lord that they are doing in Ephesus. They're standing against opposition. They're contending for the faith. The gospel is going out to people who have never heard it before. And it's Paul and Apollos who are giving Timothy and other brothers like Titus opportunities to go and serve in Corinth and continue the Lord's work there. For the Corinthian church, welcoming Timothy in his age and his inexperience, but also in his faithfulness and his eagerness to serve the Lord, that's the Corinthian church choosing to join in the work of the Lord as well. By showing humility to accept a new leader, to show him hospitality, to encourage and work alongside him, to be willing to be led, encouraged, taught, yes, even corrected by him. They're joining with Timothy in the work of the Lord. I'm really encouraged to see how our church family puts that into practice also in our community here at Forestville. Personally, for me, last term, I was away for the very last week of, uh, of youth group, and I was so encouraged to see how our team of leaders welcomed the leadership of Nick and Beth, who stepped up and led that team in my place. I'm encouraged by the ways that I see experienced team members in our welcome teams, in our tech teams, encouraging new leaders to lead. I'm encouraged by our young people who are leading at Kids Church and Youth Group who want to do the work of the Lord. As a church, let's keep encouraging our young leaders who serve in this way. Let's keep praying for them. Let's keep loving them with words of thanks for the work that they're doing. Let's keep taking moments to chat to them, encourage them and get to know them. And for those of us who do lead, are we like Paul and Apollos? Are we willing to allow others to lead and to serve and to do the work of the Lord? Or are we possessive about it and are losing sight of the big picture that God is doing in, in, in many areas at our church? The work of the Lord is so great. We need more workers, young and old, who will continue on in the work of the Lord that we're in. Well, finally, the Lord's work is marked by example, unity, and love. In verse 13, Paul almost echoes the closing words of chapter 15. He says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. And then in verse 15, Paul commends Christian brothers and sisters there in the midst of the Corinthian church who are living out this faith. He says, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and they have devoted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to submit to such people and to everyone who joins in the work and labours at it. Paul reminds the Corinthians, look at the devotion of your, of, the, of your fellow Christians. These are brothers and sisters who have come to know Christ and they have devoted themselves the Greek is deeper than that. It's, they've submitted themselves. They've addicted themselves to the service of the Lord's people. They've done this relatively free of charge. They've supplied the Corinthian church with their earthly and spiritual needs. They've promoted the gospel. They've comforted and strengthened and encouraged those who are weak. Paul's command to the Corinthians is so clear. Devote yourselves. Submit yourselves to such people to be led by them to be serving with them, to join with them in what they're doing, to labour with them in the work of the Lord. 
In verse 17, Paul shows us he was, he's been served by them as well. He says, I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived, because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refresh my spirit, and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. These three men have served the Corinthian church by meeting with Paul and giving him encouragement that he has not received from the church themselves. It's very likely that in their refreshment of Paul's spirit that these men have helped smooth over and heal frustrations, tensions between Paul and the church. They haven't just refreshed Paul's spirit either. Paul knows that they've refreshed the Corinthian church. He's, Paul's saying, if they've done this for me, meeting with me, I'm overjoyed with what they must be doing among you every day, every week. These men deserve recognition. Imitate them, honour them, submit to them, serve with them. When I think about people who come to mind for me as I think about these verses, what comes to mind for me is our faithful leaders of our growth groups each week. They are the ones who every week are asked to disciple and encourage our family in the Lord. They practice hospitality for us. They refresh our spirits by opening God's word with us. They model their faith openly to us. They lead us and encourage us to pray for each other. They open their arms in friendship to us. They pray for us in their own time. They show us compassion when we're grieving. They show us patience when we're too busy or we have too much to say. They show us grace when we don't care. They show us forgiveness when we've offended or harmed them or others. And how I pray that we would have more of them because these leaders are diligently discipling and caring and growing our church family every single week. They are worthy of recognition and we should love them as they lead us. We can love them just by being at growth group each week, encouraging them with our presence, even if it's hard. We can be eager to serve with them in caring and refreshing each other in our groups. We can be eager to pray for them, to grow to be like them, to be like Jesus, as we grow in God's love and love for each other. When I was in year nine, I loved basketball. I was addicted to it, obsessed with it. But I learned growing up that I can't love it more than I love God and I love his people. And that's where Paul ends his letter to the Corinthian church, love for God and love for each other. Even though this entire letter has been marked with rebuke, correction and warning, Paul finishes with a mark of unity and love. The Corinthian church, for all of its rough edges and blemishes, they belong with God and his people. And the dearness of love shown to the Corinthian church, it's on full display here. From verse 19, Paul says, The church in Asia greets you with love. Your friends Aquila and Priscilla, they greet you warmly in the Lord. The church that meets in their house greets you too. All the brothers and sisters send you greetings. I write this greeting in my own hand. And we see that line, don't we? Greet one, in, one another with a holy kiss. Yes, the ancient world greeted friends with a kiss of greeting. Yes, it seems like it was definitely on the lips. No, we don't greet our friends like that anymore. But this ancient display of cultural friendship, this is what it says to us today. Welcome one another with all the love and affection that true friends would welcome each other with. Don't hold each other at arm's length. Don't let your hearts be far from each other. Love one another. Hold close to each other just as God has held you close to him. You are the family of God. You are united together with all of God's church, everywhere in the world and through all of human time. Love each other just as you love Jesus. Because those who don't love Jesus are, in, are not united in his family. They're not, uni they're not unified with God at all. Paul tells us that much in verse 19. Those who have no love for the Lord, whether it's in the church or outside of it, they are cursed. A word that means they are set aside for destruction. 
a curse that will be carried out when the Lord Jesus returns. And friends, our world does not love Jesus. They are right now cursed and set apart. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Our Lord Jesus himself bears the marks of his love for his people on his body. The love of Jesus for the people of our world. I think that drives us to do the work of the Lord in all of our lives. Let's stand together, firm in the faith, eager to serve him, knowing that nothing we do is in vain as we do the work of the Lord, the Lord's way, doing everything in love. Let me pray for us. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus who brought us to you in your love to be your people. We thank you for your continued work of love in us, shaping us to be more like our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of leaders, servers, givers, role models within your church who keep pointing us to Jesus and encouraging us to live for him. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help us to stand firm, to let nothing move us, to give ourselves fully to your work, knowing that nothing we do for you is in vain. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray, and grow your kingdom. Bring more into your saving grace until that final day. Amen.